this series, I'm exploring some of Britain's most beautiful habitats and uncovering the fascinating wildlife that lives there. Beautiful wildlife. This time, I'm exploring Breckland in East Anglia, where I'm hoping to see one of this landscape's most iconic animals, the brown hare, and one of its most elusive, the stone curlew, as well as a frog that until recently had vanished from Britain altogether. This is an incredible landscape. This is Breckland in East Anglia. The term means broken landscape. And while I'm here looking for wildlife, I'm hoping to find out just what broke it. Breckland is one of Britain's least familiar, but richest habitats. It's home to an exciting variety of wildlife that is perfectly adapted to this extraordinary landscape. The varied terrain includes arable farmland, forest, and isolated pools. But the area is defined by the vast open sandy heath that gives Breckland its unique look. Covering nearly 370 square miles, this open heathland follows a chalk spine that runs from northwest Norfolk right down to the Chilterns. This whole area was once covered in forest. It was cleared by Neolithic farmers wielding axes made from local flint. After centuries of overgrazing, the land became exhausted, literally broken. When you look out across this landscape, you get a sense of how it came to be Breckland, broken land. This open heathland has remained open thanks to one small but incredibly successful animal. I can just see a pair of ears poking up over there. It's the coney or rabbit. The rabbit's constant grazing keeps the grass short and has prevented the area being reclaimed by trees and shrubs. I'll stop here for a minute and see if any of them decide to pop their heads up. You can see one running up there. You see him just sitting there, tucked down, watching, wary, alert. Everything wants to eat rabbits, and yet they still manage to survive. They're incredible creatures. When you look across here, with all this sandy soil there, that's the rabbit's warren. I can see the odd lookout, the sentry, on duty there, on its squat, watching out. And if there's a, a threat, they thump with their foot. That's their alarm. The flash of a white bunny tail is a warning to the rest of the colony that there might be a fox or stoat close by. Stevens from the Norfolk Wildlife Trust has seen just how crucial rabbits are to this unique habitat. Tell me the role rabbits play in creating Breckland. Well, rabbits are really important, and the first thing, the first reason they're important, is because they create such great ground disturbance. And ground disturbance is very important for some of the rarer um, plants and animals that we've got on our heath. And secondly, because they graze such a tight turf on the heathland, a lot of the rare lichens and rare plants like this very tight grazed turf to live in. I, I've watched rabbits closely and they're very interesting. There's a lot going on in a rabbit community. There is. Rabbits are, are really quite complex animals and they live in these sort of social groups underground. It's uh, a female dominated society, which a lot of people don't know, with, with a matriarch female who leads up the social group. The males you know, come into the warren every now and again to, 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 to sort of mate with the females. Um, so she's quite, she, stri she strictly runs the regime. They are one of the top uh, 
top food sources for, for, for large birds of prey, um, for, for foxes, for stoats in particular. Um, and of course, we, you get a lot of stoats going in and out of the warrens looking for young rabbits or looking for adult rabbits even. So yeah, they are a, a very popular a food source for, for, a lot, for, for a lot of animals. As a non-native species that was introduced, you, you're rather in favour of them. I'm extremely pro the rabbit. Um, I think rabbits are fantastic. They are a very important part of um, uh, of conservation management on the Brex, and um, they've been in they've been in our country a long time, and they're definitely here to stay. The Breckland sandy soil is ideal for digging burrows, and it's no wonder the population of rabbits here is thriving. But out on the heath. Right in the middle of this plentiful food source is the perfect place for foxes to raise their cubs. There's a real smell in the air here. Foxes mark their territory by, by scent marking. But the smell that is here is a little stronger than just ordinary scent marking. This is, this is like an earth smell, where the, where they, they, the fox's den is called an earth. And you get a much stronger scent there, uh, particularly when there are cubs. Hmm. Have a look around. Oh yes, here we go. Fox has been very interested in this hole here. In fact, that is a fox track. And uh, if I put this on top, there is this very strong X-like feature in the track there. I take those off, you'll probably be able to see that now. And you see the front claws are sharp and close together. That's an adult fox. That's not a cub. And here, I think this fox has been digging here. It looks like it's been digging to try to get down in there to get after something. Signs of predation. All, all the way around this gorse bush here, I'm finding droppings. Foxes will leave droppings, particularly on a mound like that. On a little raised mound, tussock. That's also part of their territory marking. You can see lots of rabbit fur in that dropping. That's a big fox. And here again, you see the tail on the dropping here, the tail at the end that tells you it's a predator. And lots of rabbit fur in there. And the light colour, because it's been eating a lot of bone, a lot of calcium in there. And you, that, that dropping you know, on that mound is, is basically, it's a territorial marking post as a fox saying, this is mine here. Well, the weather's breaking a little bit. These, these areas of Breckland we, can be quite exposed in bad weather. I'm finding all the droppings just on the edge of this clump of uh, gorse. So I'm certain there's an earth in here. There's a, the really white droppings there. You can see lots of bone being consumed. At this time of year, fox cubs have been out and about for some time. When they first emerge, they, they'll hang around the entrance to the earth under the watchful gaze of their mum. But then they very quickly start to become independent and they're very good hunters from an early age. And with all these rabbits here, they really are parked right in amongst their food source. With luck, I'll get a chance to see some of these foxes. But as they're mainly nocturnal, I may have to wait until dusk. I'm exploring the Brex in Norfolk, discovering what makes this landscape so special. Breckland is made up of wide sandy heathland lined by Scots pines with small knots of woodland. But since the Stone Age, it's been the flinty ground here that has attracted the interest of man. This grassy lunar landscape is Grimes Graves. It contains over 400 flint mines, the earliest dating back nearly 5,000 years. Flint mined from this landscape was one of the most precious and versatile materials for our Stone Age ancestors, as long as you knew how to work it. 
I can't come to Brecklands without coming to see an old friend who, for me in many ways, personifies this environment. That's John Lord. He's the country's leading flint napper. And uh, we've known each other for a very long while. John used to be a custodian here at Grimes Graves. Now he gives demonstrations on how to make flint axes and arrowheads from raw lumps of Breckland flint, using the same techniques as Neolithic man once did. I'd like to finish up with that. Yeah, well, that's beautiful. I'd like to. But people in the past could do this um, on a regular basis with very little trouble. It takes years of practice to be able to hit the flint at just the right angle, to thin it down to leave a razor-sharp cutting edge. Using a red deer antler as a hammer, John is able to work the flint into the different shapes needed for various tools. I'm making a spearhead, just like the ones used by Neolithic hunters. It's nearly 30 years since John gave me my first lesson in napping, but there's still plenty to learn. Well, there you go, John, that's what I've knocked up, just to point, what do you think? Yeah, pretty good. I haven't got quality control here at the minute, but uh, <laughs> yeah, it'll do me. It reminds me of just how skilled yeah. you are, because all the time you've just been gently working your way through that, I've been fighting problems the whole way. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think I've ironed out most of the problems. What's interesting to me is how quickly you achieve uh, an enlarged version of what you want to finish up with, in terms not just of width, but, but, but thinness. And right. as, you, as you thin it, you're still going to be able to retain width. Really nice. The Breckland topsoil is littered with flint but the really good quality stone lies several metres underground. You might think the challenge of getting at it would be beyond Stone Age man, but we shouldn't underestimate their ingenuity and engineering skill. It's hard to imagine today, but this area of Breckland was once a hive of activity and industrial landscape. And to get a sense of that, we need to go underground and have a look in this particular flint mine, which has been excavated. All right there, John. Wow, oh, John, that's it's special, isn't it? The temperature's really dropped as we come yeah. down in here. Yeah. And, and I feel like we've stepped back in into the Stone Age. It's real, isn't it? It is. Yeah. So when they excavated this, they just removed the infill. And what we see is mine, you know, on maybe on the last day of its working. That's it. Except, of course, the sloping white, dazzling chalk. And, it, and what hard work it must have been moving that chalk. And uh, were the flint sponges. Yeah. What, what, what were they? It's, it's silica that forms around marine, larger marine creatures in the chalk. And so yeah. the, the, these bands of flint were things living on the sea, sea, sea floor that yeah. were now fossilised. Yeah. This mine was excavated in 1914 to reveal a huge shaft up to 10 metres deep. It leads to a complex underground system of tunnels that enabled prehistoric miners to work on their knees to dig out the seams of high-quality black flint buried within the chalk. Ah, I'm right there. Oh. You can see the pick marks there. That must be where the axes were being used, yeah. the polished axes. The edges, and it's right there. There's not a blemish on it. No, it's, no, it's just as, as sharp as the day that that was made. I mean, they did a fantastic job of excavating this mine. So what we're looking at is a mine that has been abandoned. It's, they, 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 they've got to the point where they think it's no longer economical to remove stuff. Is that right? That's it. And, and this is what they're after. This, this giant lump here of floor stone. Really heavy piece of... Beautiful. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. And that's come out from here. 
just around. I don't think it's so far from where it was actually freed up from. Lovely bit of floor stone. Don't know why they didn't take it out. It's a mystery. It's a mystery. It's a, mystery. It's a good piece of flint that you or I think is incredibly useful for making other things. I'd love to get my hands on it. <laughs> <laughs> Faced with the challenge of removing these large lumps of flint, Neolithic men had to rely on the Brecklands' available natural resources. John, I can see over there, look, there's a red deer antler. We're not allowed to touch that, are we? That's where it was found. No, that's, just, that's more or less where it was uh, uncovered. Uh, you know, it's, just, it's broken. And it's uh, come off of a live animal. It hasn't been shed. That's right. Antlers were very plentiful in those times. And the, the antler pink would be doing this, going around, revealing the tops yes. of the lions. I mean, it is eerie being in here. All of these depressions in the floor, obviously, where they've removed big lumps of flint, it's like we've stepped back into the Stone Age. The dry and flinty Breckland soil may seem an unlikely place for anything to thrive, but in fact, it's helped to create the perfect habitat for one of our rarest and most beautiful birds. The bird I'm looking for is very shy during the day, particularly when it's nesting, so I have to be careful. I don't want to disturb it. One of the great things for watching wildlife is to use your vehicle as a mobile hide. And one thing you can do is put a mount on the window. That, that simulates a kind of rig that professional wildlife cameramen use to get shots of big game on the Serengeti. You need to work out just about where you want it. Pull the mirror in so there's no obstruction and I drop it right down like so. And then I can fit my scope on there. And that's very stable, it gives a very stable platform. Now I've set this rig up because I'm trying to get to see a bird that really likes these flinty Breckland fields. But it doesn't like disturbance, it's very, very flighty. It's called a stone curlew and I know that there's one nesting in the next field. These rare birds are mainly nocturnal, so they rely on the flinty Breckland soil to camouflage them from predators during the day. Their speckled eggs are also perfectly disguised among the flint, where they are simply laid in a shallow scrape in the soil. The male and the female share their workload, taking it in turns to sit on their eggs for 27 days until they hatch. Breckland is one of the few places in Britain where it's possible to see these birds, which need warm, dry soil and low vegetation so they can keep an eye out for danger. Their large yellow eyes are extremely sensitive and are adapted for seeking out insects at night. By October, these birds will leave the Brecklands to winter in southern Europe and Africa before they return next spring. In the next field, some eggs have already hatched. Paul Batchelor from the RSPB has come to tag and gather data on the fledglings in order to keep track of their progress. The easiest time to do this is before they start to fly at just 40 days old. 
Well, I watched that from a far pool. That was fantastic. Oh, well, yeah. Bit of exercise, eh? Oh, yeah. Well, uh, well I really early today. I had to run a lot further than that, actually, and uh, got nutmeg a few times by going through my legs. And <laughs> <laughs> So what's the purpose of the tagging pool? Well, it's basically twofold. Um, reading the colouring combinations on their legs, we know which juveniles have fledged. Uh, that gives us a very clear idea of the productivity for the year. Uh, the other purpose of it is when these birds are older and they nest, we know exactly which birds are in which pair. Uh, if they lose a nest and put a new nest down in another field, we know if it's just one pair or if there's two different pairs. And that gives us a very clear idea of exactly how many pairs we've got in the area. And you only disturb the bird the once. You just bring it in now. Yep, we bring it the one time and, uh, and then you can tell. We'll need to catch it again, yeah. That's right. Brilliant. Yeah, yeah. And here's the chick. Look at that. Oh, look at them. Oh, oh look at that. Beautiful. They've got the most compelling eye, haven't they? They have a very character's eyes. You can see if I put them down the bare ground how um, his camouflage. We're relying on the camouflage. Yeah. Typically, when they do hide, they'll, they'll get down a little gully like this or something like that. that. Yeah, you could easily step on it, basically. Well, what about their eye? How good is their vision? Oh, they've got excellent vision. Uh, they actually do a lot of foraging at night. So they've got excellent nocturnal vision. Um, this time of year, when they're feeding chicks, uh, they're quite active in the daytime, looking for food for the chicks. But uh, outside the breeding season, they do a lot of their feeding at night time. They've got excellent nocturnal vision. Um, the bird I was watching earlier looked at me with the most suspicious gaze. Their eyes are also very characterful. Um, you can often tell by just looking at, you know, you come across a pair of birds in a field, just by looking at them, you can get an idea of whether they're likely to have a nest or not, just from their expression. If they are breeding, they, they have a very nervous look, their eyes are wide and they look, you know, quite anxious. If they're not breeding, they look a lot more relaxed, yeah. The number of stone curlews declined dramatically in the 1950s when a myxomatosis epidemic killed large numbers of the Breckland rabbits. Without the rabbits, the flinty Breckland heath started to disappear, leaving the curlews without a nesting site. Now the RSPB is working with local farmers to help protect eggs and chicks by providing safe nesting sites in fallow fields, giving these wonderful birds a fighting chance. With their help, the population in this area has more than tripled from fewer than 70 pairs in 1985 to about 230 pairs now. The yeah, adults will be somewhere nearby watching us, uh, basically waiting for us to go, uh, and then as soon as we disappear, they'll come back, call to the chicks, and the whole family will get back together. Okay. Again. So they won't be too disturbed that you've got your centres on the birds? No, just they're not bothering at all. They're not, they're not too fussed by that. So the process is nearly over now and we're going to have to move away so that we're not causing any further disturbance here and uh, we're going to look from a distance and see what happens. The chick's parents have been watching on anxiously so we retreat to a safe distance to see what happens next. Well, that's great. I can see both the adult birds returning now. And they're going to check out the whole area to make sure that they perceive no threat. That's fantastic. So it looks like that operation has been completely successful. And because of that work, those, those two chicks become ambassadors for their species and can be monitored. It enables us to measure our effect on their population and hopefully enables us to improve situations for them. So with the help of the, the, the work of the RSPB here and the support of local farmers, the health of this population is improving. It's fantastic. I've come to the Brex in East Anglia to explore the fascinating wildlife that lives here. Brackland has the hottest summers and coldest winters in the country. This low, open landscape bakes in the summer heat, helping to create this truly unique habitat. One of the joys of Breckland is like any arid environment, it is romantically supplied with cool, 
palm oases like this one. This is a very special type of pond. It's called a pingo and its history is fascinating. These were formed during the Ice Age. You have to imagine the land then covered in glaciers and underneath the glaciers there were aquifers pushing water upwards to create a mound of ice. When the glaciers retreated, these mounds of ice slowly melted, leaving this depression here. They're a bit mysterious because no one can figure out why they haven't silted up and vanished. But they haven't, and that's a good thing because today, this pingo holds a real secret. What I'm looking for are pool frogs. That's Britain's rarest frog species. It was a species that was once common throughout the UK until it died out. Today, this pingo is at the center of efforts to reintroduce this species. As yet, we don't know whether those efforts will prove to be successful, but everyone's got their fingers crossed. Now there's one, just moving across the top of the leaves there. And there's a light green stripe down the middle of their back. And they have dark spots on their legs. And their eye is quite light coloured. What a wonderful thing to see. The pool frogs are most active during the summer months when they spend nearly all of their time in or very close to the water. The small sunny pingo is the ideal place for them to spawn and also provides them with a plentiful supply of food. It's surprising how fragile nature can be. In 1995, pool frogs were declared extinct in Britain. It's not fully understood why, but it's likely that the loss of suitable pools due to draining of wetlands, unchecked shrub growth, and air pollution interfered with their ability to breed successfully. But five years ago, pool frogs and tadpoles collected from Sweden were officially reintroduced here in Breckland. And thanks to the careful work being done here, this species stands a chance of flourishing again. Neil Armachalu from the Forestry Commission has been looking after these frogs since the reintroduction program began. You know, this is a beautiful spot today, but it's also a very significant place for you. Yes, it is. Yeah, it's, um, it is lovely, as you say, and it's great to put back into it something that's been missing for, uh, well, 15 years. So, uh, uh, we've been involved in the pool frog reintroduction, um, and it's early days at the moment, but uh, after five years, we think that we've got a population that's sustaining itself here. There was some uh, controversy as to whether pool frogs are native or not. People were unsure as to whether it was uh, a genuinely native species or had been introduced um, during the Middle Ages, uh, as many other um, amphibian species have been to the country. So work was done on the genetics, on the call, and also on uh, archaeological remains, looking for bones. And uh, the uh, summary from that was that it was uh, a species that had been here for some time. Well, I can understand looking at you know, you know, physical remains and DNA, but how do you analyse the sound, the croak of a frog? Well, you run it through a machine and you get the shape of its call. And uh, in Europe, um, you've really got frogs from the north and frogs from the south. And um, we found that the the frogs in Norfolk had a northern accent. So um, when we were looking around for you know, which frogs to reintroduce, having decided that they were native, we often went for the northern frogs from Scandinavia. But it's not an easy thing to do. There are a lot of things that you have to get right before you can carry out a, an introduction like that. 
Yes, yes, it's, it's uh, very important to understand why they went extinct in the first place. Otherwise, you're just condemning the uh, species that you want to reintroduce to almost certain death. So you need to understand and put right the factors that were uh, caused the original decline and extinction. One of the things that I've noticed is how we can become very easily accustomed to the lack of something. That there are generations of youngsters, say, growing up, who have no idea of an elm tree because they've grown up in a world devoid of it. Not, not only have you reintroduced a frog to these pools, you've reintroduced a sound to our landscape. Yes, yes. I mean, these they have a very distinctive uh, call and they, they, they croak quite loudly. The males gather in the centre of uh, the breeding pools and they'll, they'll croak against each other, they'll face each other off and see who can, has got the strongest, loudest croak. And that's what uh, attracts the females in. Can you make the noise? Yep, yeah, it's... Um, <coughs> go on, you have a go and see if you can get them to call back. Okay, I'll give it a go. Do it again. <laughs> try it. You've got to get a side of your cheek to go. <laughs> you do it better than I do. Go on. I'll listen to see if you've got any interest. Not today. No. Like a lot of wildlife, the Breckland animals are wariest during the day. I stand a better chance of seeing them at dusk or dawn, so I'll need to make plans to stay right in the heart of this habitat. Well, this is going to be my home for the next couple of days. The best way to see an environment is to stay there and camp safari style, and that's exactly what I'm going to do. Obviously, I've had to arrange special permission to do this. You can't just go and set up a camp anywhere, but it doesn't matter whether you set up a camp like this or you just take an ordinary tent to a campsite. The key thing is to be there in the environment at the right time of day. Just tension the rope. I'm just sleep here tonight, that'll be fine. And uh, there we go, so just a very simple camp, a roof over my head. That's all I really need, fireplace, and I'm set up. I like camps like this because you've got such good access to the countryside around you. I can see out in all 360 degrees. I've got very good visibility here. I can just sit quietly here later with a pair of binoculars and watch. I put my camp up under oak trees. Oak trees very rarely drop a dead branch. Over there, over here, lots of beech trees, beautiful beech woodland. And under beech it looks the perfect place to put a camp. But beech trees are notorious for dropping branches big enough to kill. So you never camp under beech. But beach does provide, obviously, lots of good firewood, and that's perfect. Everywhere you look here, there are bits of flint on the surface, and they, like this one, even bits of flint that were worked a long, long while ago. I'm gonna, just going to break that a little bit, give it a sharp edge. I've got a steel here with which to create sparks. Long after Grimes Graves closed down as a production centre for stone axes, Brandon, the nearby town, became the centre of the gunflint industry. And uh, millions of gunflints were produced there. One way of looking at it is that our empire that we once had was built upon the sparks that came from those flints. Here we go. Uh, 
can see how reliable that flint is. Put that in some of this local gorse, some dead gorse, and hopefully that'll catch me. Just show you why you mustn't casually discard a cigarette of a gorse heath. Just as I expected, as the sun starts to set, these woods come alive. A family of foxes emerge from an earth in the heart of the Breckland Forest. Born in March, these cubs first venture above ground in April, and now they explore and play close to the safety of the earth. both parents to bring them food, the plentiful Brackland rabbits make up a large part of their diet. By the time they're five months old, they'll be independent and able to hunt for themselves. But for now, they're free to play. As night falls, the bricks fill with their own nocturnal soundtrack, providing me with a magical lullaby. That's the sound of my charm. Fantastic sound. That's the male. He's got the white bars on his wings. Trying to attract a female. Lovely to watch. I'm in the Breckland, a vast area of heathland in East Anglia. With its dry, sandy soil, this area looks more like the Russian steppe than England. But many of the animals that live here are perfectly adapted to this extraordinary landscape. The best way to get to know any habitat is to totally immerse yourself, and to do that, there's no better way than camping. Well, it was a lovely night. Sleeping outdoors uh, in a bedroll like that is just perfect. It's like having a bed outdoors. Of course, you wake up very early with the sun, but it's nice. It's a very peaceful way of sleeping. Through the night, it, there's something moving close by, you hear it, and you just feel tuned in to what's happening here. There's some pine needles that I collected earlier. One thing you can do with these is make a refreshing tea. It's not something you should drink all the time, because there are some chemicals in here. It wouldn't be good for you long term, but occasionally it's nice. It's a, it's a refreshing drink. You need quite a few to get the flavour. The tea contains vitamin C, so you don't want to boil it. You steep it just like any normal tea. And uh, you give it a good few minutes to brew. And you can even add a lot, little bit of sugar or honey to it if you want to sweeten it. That's very nice. That should be brewed now. I do as I just lift the needles out. Let's have a look. That's nice. It's a delicate flavour and uh, it's really nice on a cold day. Very refreshing though. As the sun rises over the heath, 
the breckled animals venture out to feed before sheltering from potential predators and the heat of the day. Early morning is the perfect time for me to go in search of one of the most magical creatures in this landscape, the brown hare. Hares are usually solitary creatures, but where there's plenty of food, like in this farmer's field, they'll gather together to graze. Their long ears and large body distinguish it from the distant cousin, the rabbit. They're also more athletic and powerful. Their long limbs allow them to reach speeds up to 70 kilometers an hour to quickly escape their predators. They're a native species and they've got this remarkable ability to live right out in the open. They don't dig burrows and they just rely on their wits and their ability to hunker down in the in the shrubbery. This baby hare or leveret has been left by its mother in this tall grass to hide it from potential predators. It will lie here motionless during the day waiting for its mother to return at night. While it's light, she'll be out searching for herbs and grasses to eat. Up here in Breckland, they absolutely thrive, and you'll see some of the largest hares that are to be found in the British Isles in this part of the world. Very special. Before I leave the Brecks, there's one more animal I'm hoping to see. These pine woodlands are home to over 1,000 red deer. These magnificent creatures are some of the largest red deer in Britain. The stag's impressive branched antlers can reach up to a metre high. As well as being beautiful to look at, they've played a vital role in man's history with the area. It makes me think about the people who dug out Grimes' graves. There were those red deer antlers. Well, those mines were in operation. These animals were fundamental part of human life. This was the prey upon which we depended for a lot of our needs. It wasn't just the answer to get the flint out. It was also skin for clothing, sinews for the thread to sew the clothing up, meat, bone tools for making needles to sew the clothes. And of course the flint was needed for the arrowhead to catch the deer. I've had a fantastic time here in, in the Brex. It's an area that keeps drawing me back. Incredible wildlife. But I think that sight has to beat all for me, personally. To see them still here, thriving in this landscape, is just the most special thing. <laughs>